I'm saying, well, then, uh, then what are you doing? I want to know what the potential is. And quite frankly, I couldn't find anybody, and I asked some pretty good fellows, and the real good physicist would tell me he didn't know, couldn't define it exactly. Feynman will tell you he can't define it exactly, and he does so in his three volumes of physics. He tells you don't look for a definition of force. You ain't going to get none, like the Cajun said. So, charge, what in the world is electric charge? Well, I'm going to give you a little quick and dirty definition of electric charge. It's a piece of mass, whatever mass is, that's engaged in a violent energetic exchange with a vacuum. The vacuum is nothing in the world but a seething sea of raw energy. I don't have to prove that anymore. Even the U.S. Patent Office has recognized it and issues patents recognizing the vacuum as a source of energy. So help me God, the mountain finally came to Mohammed. So nowadays, the vacuum, the energetic vacuum, which is only about 50 years old, been known for about 50 years, been proven for about 50 years, has finally been accepted. Remember that 50-year figure before we get something accepted in the ordinary science. Mass is, in fact, engaged in a very, I mean, charged mass in a very violent exchange of energy with a vacuum. But it's a funny little exchange. It's a peculiar little bird. It's spinning. It has spin. Now, what it does is it doesn't quite reflect all of that back, re-emit it all back as virtual particles. That's a particle that appears so fast and disappears so fast you can't grab it individually, but lots of them make up all the forces that we have if a whole bunch of them get together. They generate all the forces in nature, quantum field theory. So what we have is a little bit of these things, like an old spinning wheel. This is a crude analogy. Don't press it too far. But uh, like a spinning wheel takes a little bit of the fibers from the cotton and weaves them into a long thread. This thing weaves some of these little bitty virtual particle changes into coherent changes, groups of coherence, which if they'll hit another particle will make an ordinary observable change will translate the particle. What did I say with all that mess? I've got to speak two ways. Some people here are technical, some people are not. Non-technically, what I said is this thing absorbs a lot of energy, radiates most of it back in the same form, but some of it it puts out in the form that generates all the fields and all the potentials and all the energy in those fields and potentials that reach from that charge all the way out to space. Now, this has been known for 40 years in particle physics, both experimentally and theoretically. It doesn't appear in electrodynamics to this day. I have been accused, and because I work in free energy systems that can permissibly go uh, put out more energy than you yourself have to input, they don't put out more than they get in. They put in more than you input. They get the other from outside. Been accused of talking perpetual motion, as is every other scientist who's tried to uh, study the area. You want to know who really believes in perpetual motion machines? Who teaches them from a platform? Every university in the Western world, every Ph.D. in physics, every Ph.D. in electrodynamics, teaches that the electron and the proton create from nothing all the energy and all those fields that that source charge produces reaching across the universe. Like the Cajuns say, man, in my wildest nightmare, I couldn't approach that many of them perpetual motion machines. So you want to know who really advocates perpetual motion machines? Ordinary science. The reason is they assume an inert vacuum no place for them to get any energy. So that means they create it all. But they just call them the source charge, and the energy pours out, and it continues to pour out forever, never quits. But you can't produce an overusing machine when you've got all kind of free pumps producing all this energy. It's ludicrous. If I gave you a free set of fire hoses and you couldn't produce any water to use, there'd be something wrong with your head. If the, if the things were running water all the time and you claimed you couldn't find any water for free, goodness gracious. Next slide, please. This really is what's in electrodynamics, ladies and gentlemen, so help me goodness. 
The spin of a particle, we measure transverse waves. Yes, indeed we do. Our instruments measure transverse waves. And that's not at all what comes in from the vacuum. What our instruments measure is electron wiggles in the wires, like we're measuring in wires. Now the electrons in the wire, look at the little bottom diagram there, are spinning. And ahead of them in the wire, they've got all these other electrons pushing back on them. So they can't go that away. They've got too much forcing back on them. And they're spinning, so they act like a little gyro, and they precess side to side, which they do mostly. That's in the textbook. Electrons move down the wire in the current at about four inches per hour in a nominal little old circuit. The signal goes down the wire if it's... Uh, Inductance and capacitance free, it's the speed of light, and since it's really got a little bit of that, a little bit less than the speed of light down the wire. The electrons don't move like that. They move about four inches per hour. So the electrons move most of their movements side to side, and that's what our instruments measure, and that's what they detect, and that's indeed the detected measurement, transverse waves. And that's the reason together. If they really are little gyros, and they really are precessing, and all we're measuring is precession waves of the electrons, the restrained electrons, then we have just proven that the wave coming in from the vacuum, the perturbation from space that disturbed them, was longitudinal. Or else you've got to throw out all gyro theory, and you've got to throw out electron spin, and a few dozen other things. So what we have done, when they started this business, the vacuum was considered to have mass in it everywhere. So whatever came into the wire was considered just to be fluid shaking, and all we were doing was measuring the shaking fluid as it came in from space. Very uh, reasonable assumption for that time. After we found out better, we never changed a thing. We never changed a thing. Next slide, please. Oh, boy, now this is a good one. Maxwell's equations, of course, were highly restricted by Heaviside and a couple other folks. But Maxwell himself and Faraday made some enormous errors. They were legitimately made at the time. These were not diabolical. They're not a conspiracy at all. They were the best knowledge of the time. But today I want you to see how strange they are. Faraday thought that his lines of force were actual physical strings in this physical matter that filled all space, they thought. <clears throat> and so these physical strings, when there was an electromagnetic disturbance in the ether, what it was was these strings. These were taut strings. These strings were twanging. And that's where the notion of the transverse wave in the ether came from. The spirit is twanging strings. And Maxwell says, and I sort of paraphrase the quote, I said about to capture exactly the thinking of Faraday. Now, he did have to replace those strings with tubes, taut tubes of force, but that's pretty close to strings. And so the whole notion of transverse electromagnetic waves in space is based on twanging strings, and so help me God, all the time I've been alive, I never saw a twanging string in space yet. Plum, like the Cajun says. Next slide, please. But then we never changed the models. We never changed the equations. What really happens? Well, we ignored, they also, uh, Maxwell ignored half of the energy and half the waves. Threw them out because it didn't know anything. You see, the electron hadn't been discovered at the time. Nobody knew there was a thing called an electron. Uh, the atom had not been discovered. The molecule was a formless blob. Everything was fluid dynamics. All they wrote was shaking fluid. They didn't write electron spin theory and, and nuclei of atoms and all of this. None of that stuff is in there. So what they had ignored the following. When I produce a disturbance in a transmission wire, what I do is I disturb the electrons up there. They wiggle, waggle, and precess sideways, and so do the nuclei. Now, the nuclei is a lot heavier than the electrons, but they recoil with equal energy, else I've got to throw out Newton's third law. Well, they do recall because we can measure that, and any physicist will admit that, but that isn't included in electrodynamics. Because now what happens? The electrons reach the surface of the wire and stop. In other words, they are embedded with this energy exchange in, in the surrounding 
ether or vacuum and they shake the vacuum